In this lecture, we'll talk about a little bit about the conventional maintenance of lawns, but a lot about sustainable methods of maintaining lawns, which are tricky to do because they're by nature monocultures, resource intensive, prone to disease, um, need a lot of water. But there are things you can do to increase the sustainability of a lawn and decrease the amount of resources and time you put into it. Lawns aren't all bad if they're taken care of well. They can prevent erosion, reducing runoff, filtering water into the soil, and create a cooling effect, in addition to their beauty and their performance in things like sports fields. The benefits of the one-third rule is it avoids scalping, cutting so far down like this person is doing here, which can expose the soil surface, cutting down into the more mature, older stems, and allow openings between them so there's little pockets of soil that are exposed and weeds can then grow. Um, if you take a higher one-third rule setting on your mower, the clippings can be recycled into the turf and the turf recovers quickly. Um, in general, you'll want to mow it more often in the spring when there's more water and more warmth and things are growing faster than in the summer. In the autumn, it's going back into a more dormant stage, so you would water it, dial it back a bit then too. Some sustainable cultural practice you, practices you can enact are keeping the blades of your um, lawn mower really sharp, and that will um, make the cut cleaner and decrease pest um, infections. So the, the sharper your blade, the less surface area is created when your um, blades of grass are wounded by mowing. and the less surface area for pathogens to get in. Use the third one-third rule. Never remove more than one-third of the leaf tissue or the height of the blade at any one time that you're mowing. So keep your mower blade set really high. That keeps uh, takes a little bit off, makes it nice and even looking, but it doesn't take so much off that it stresses the plant out. Um, always follow a proper irrigation method excuse me, a proper um, fertilization method, um, four or more pounds per thousand square feet, and spread it evenly if possible, and proper irrigation, preventing drought stress to enhance the growth of that turf and avoid overwatering and runoff. Now, you can water it a lot less than you probably think you can from traditional turf irrigation regimes, you know, on 15 minutes or so, three or four times a week. You can water it less and it will still stay green and, and look pretty good. If you water it longer each time and less often, that's one way to do it. And you can also use a multiple start times on your controller to water um, longer in one day and let it infiltrate in between the start times. Mowing your lawn at the proper height it will stimulate more dense leafing out and dense turf. It's like a gentle pruning on the top instead of a hard prune. And again, fertilization and proper irrigation is helping to build a strong turf and keep it growing thick and full to, to compete out any weeds. A really well taken care of lawn, which partly is going to be your irrigation, which is the irrigation design to make sure it gets the water spread evenly and enough and not too much. Um, if it's done correctly, turf is a very um, aggressive and competitive type of plant system and it should outcompete most weeds. So it's often poor care, poor fertilization, poor irrigation that leads to bare spots that leads to weeds taking hold. A little more detail on what I just said. The weeds don't cause poor turf. They are a result of poor turf management or poor, in, poor installation of the turf. Tips that I've received from a professional um, groundskeeper, Jay Sullivan in the Goleta Valley School District, he would limit mowing to once a week um, to keep the weeds from seeding, um, but also keep the mower set at a higher setting, so not, you know, it was less than a third was taken off. Heavy aeration, at least annually, with a hydro hydraulic aerator that takes out plugs of soil and brings them up to the surface, but leaves holes for water and air to get into the root zone, which is important. 
and fertilizing with organics three times a year. Also in Goleta Valley School and Carpentria Schools, they do compost tea application. And um, there's different kinds of application rates. Here's one 15 gallons of tea diluted and then applied to a turf, sprayed over the turf. All of that can help. Even application of compost can help annually as well. First, figure out how much fertilizer is needed and if it is needed by doing a soil test. You can do a simple texture test in a jar. You can send soil to a lab for analysis um, to see what your NPK levels are. You can also get simple NPK uh, test kits at a uh, garden store and find out how much nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium are in your soil. And then you can kind of gauge what kind of fertilizer would be best. But when you do use an organic fertilizer, kind of a basic landscape or turf mix, three times a year, you really can't go wrong because they're slow release and it won't overburden the soil or the plants with nutrients all at once. Things to think about when improving your soil in your turf. Of course, the texture and structure is important. If the texture um, and the structure tend to be pretty compacted, you want to aerate it and maybe add gypsum for clay soils that will help break up the clay chunks. Your nitrogen, phosphor, and potassium to increase those, you can add the appropriate fertilizer, compost, compost tea. Also do an acidity test on the soil to see if it's too alkaline or too acidic. Add lime to make it um, less acidic and add powdered sulfur to make it um, more acidic if you need to balance things out. And you want to get right around 6.5 pH as your goal. I've been mentioning the nitrogen, phosphor, and potassium. Those are the major nutrients that are needed for the turf's growth and other plants too. Nitrogen for vegetative growth, phosphorus for root growth, and potassium for stress tolerance like heat, cold, drought, and pest stress. General guide for turf fertilizers. When you're starting a turf out, you want to have a higher um, level of phosphorus to get the roots going. And in the spring, that would be the case too. In the winter, you go more um, a little heavier on the potassium and the nitrogen. And then uh, for general, you have a, a something like 7 to 1 to 1 ratio and a little bit higher nitrogen too. Because most of the time we want our turf to be growing well and growing thick and full. There are different types of nitrogen fertilizers if that's what you need to apply. Some are rapidly soluble in water. Um, that's ammonium nitrate. Ammonium sulfate is also one that will add nitrogen and ammonium phosphate. The ammonium part is where the, the nitrogen is introduced and urea as well. There's ones that are slowly soluble in water shown there and there's also slow release sulfur coated urea which is kind of a nice um, it's a nice compromise you're using a synthetic produced fertilizer, but it's not quick release, which can overload the soil and plants with nutrients, but slow release, like the decomposition of organic matter, more close to that rate of release of the nutrients. Here are some examples of organic nitrogen fertilizers. They're a somewhat of a high cost per nitrogen you know, unit. Um, because they come from natural organic sources, they won't have that much nitrogen in them, so you need to add more to get the amount of nitrogen you want. And so they tend to be a little more expensive in that sense. And this graph shows you that the shoots of turf grow in early through late spring, even before the roots begin their peak growth. So fertilizers should follow suit. Early spring fertilizers should learn, lean more heavily on nitrogen for above ground vegetative growth. Late spring and summer should focus more on phosphorus for root development. And the fall spike in shoot growth followed by root growth should also take into account the same dynamics. Now let's talk about turf irrigation. Turf uses approximately one inch of water per week, depending on the climate, the type of turf, and the evapotranspirative rate. The water is um, applied to a turf to cool the turf down, and of course, allowing for its growth through photosynthesis and support uh, biological processes. So decomposition of organic matter in the soil, which in turn feeds the turf. Best to ir irrigate early in the morning. You don't want to do it in the evening or 
in the too much in the middle of the night because then the water sits on the blades of grass when it's cold and moist and it can cause diseases. That's like kind of the perfect recipe for fungal and bacterial growth is cool, moist on the plant. So try to avoid that. Insect pests in turf are relatively rare. There's not that many, but there are some like the Japanese beetle grubs that sometimes like raccoons or possums will pull up your turf looking for these. They feed um, on the on the actual shoots, but they also, I mean, excuse me, the grubs feed on the shoots. Um, and then the raccoons and possums and even skunks will rip up your turf trying to get to the grubs. So it can be problematic. Um, like insect pests, there aren't too many on turf that come from bacteria and fungi, but there are a few. Two shown here are necrotic ring spot on Kentucky bluegrass in the upper right, and that is caused by a fungus and rots the roots of the turf. And there's also one um, called rust that is also another fungus that grows on ryegrass. And that can happen, I see rust happen with water that sits on the blades of grass too long and into the night, too much moisture. Corn gluten meal is something that can keep weeds from taking hold in your lawn. It can reduce weeds by about 50%. Sometimes even new crabgrass or foxtail, dandelion weeds, and it uh, creates a layer on the surface of the soil at the base of the, the grass stems where if the weeds do germinate there, this um, corn gluten desiccates them. It like sucks up all the water out of the little sprouting seed of the weed and kills it. Thatch buildup in a turf is common. It's the, thatch is the layer of living and dead organic material that builds up as these grasses grow. Um, it can be broken down by microbes, but sometimes not fast enough. So older lawns get build up of the roots, rhizome stems that form a thicker and higher and higher turf and that is the thatch. And sometimes it needs to be cut down or scalped to get it all the way back down to the ground because you get a turf that keeps getting higher and higher and the stems longer and longer. So the water has a harder time getting down into the soil where the roots are growing. A positive of some thatch is that the turf is softer and it protects cr the crowns of the grass plants from getting injured and reduces evapotranspiration um, and evaporation because it's a little bit like a little mini forest there creating more humidity against the soil. The disadvantages are that it can harbor diseases in there and pests that can grow in that little thicket of the thatch. There's shallow root growth prone to drying out and it absorbs pesticides too which can accumulate there. So it's okay if you've got a thatch maybe about an inch, inch and a quarter in depth but too much more is going to cause problems with the actual growth of your turf. So you can um, rake and remove the thatch. You can core it for aeration. Um, and like I said, you can do a kind of harsh one-time type of scalping that can get some of it um, removed. Here's a list of some seasonal activities to do with turf management. Um, keeping the mower blade high all, all the summer is good, three or more inches. Um, lower the blade in the fall when the temperatures go down and get a little cooler in the 70s and lower the blade again in early November. So this is matching um, the rate of growth of the actual turf and the evapotranspirative rate in the climate. So it's just kind of going along with that. You can overseed onto areas that have gotten um, maybe too much shade or too much traffic and they're you're showing dirt spots and you want to spread new grass seeds within a layer of compost and keeping it moist to help compete out any weed growth. And of course fertilizing if you can a few times a year but definitely in the fall. In the fall you're focusing your fertilizer on the roots um, so you reduce fertilization with nitrogen you, and you, you buy ones that are emphasizing or have more potassium, phosphorus, and calcium that helps the roots grow. Alfalfa based fertilizers are great for the fall and also seaweed or humate based products. 
another thing that uh, topic that can be brought up when talking about turf is sheet mulching especially here in southwestern United States a lot of people want to convert their turf which is a high water use kind of high labor type of element in your garden and change it over to maybe perennials or natives sheet mulching is a, a simpler way to do that than digging it all out especially if you have a turf made of some rhizomatous grass like crabgrass, Bermuda grass, Kikuya grass, which just keeps coming back over and over. And this is a, a method of basically killing your lawn, making sure it doesn't come back, and then planting into it. Here you can see they're spreading cardboard over the existing lawn, um, and hopefully we'll be planting more drought tolerant and water conserving plants instead. So it's a conversion, converting your lawn, killing it, and converting it to something else. After the cardboard is put down, um, mulch can be spread on top of it. And a step that you're not seeing here is often the turf can be removed with a sod cutter. It's a, a machine. Um, or you can dig it out and then put the cardboard down. Um, we use, here at Santa Barbara City College, we've done this a few times, and we use big rolls of cardboard that we purchase, not these boxes. With the boxes, it's just inevitable that there's some little crack that um, that remains, even though you try to overlap it all. And the grasses, especially, like I said, the ones that grow by rhizomes, they, they find their way up through that crack and then spread out over the mulch again, so it kind of defeats the whole purpose. So I like the big rolls, sheets that we roll out and overlap and staple down of cardboard instead of these pieces of cardboard. And then we put compost and mulch on top of that and plant directly into that. Here the mulch has been spread and now they're digging holes to create new plantings on top. Another trick with this type of sheet mulching is you're planting then into holes you dig through the cardboard and mulch and you're putting in your new plants. They're perennials or water conserving plants or natives. But that's those little areas where you dig that hole through the cardboard are places where if, if there's little bits left of your turf underneath that can grow up through that hole. So you have to monitor those holes and keep the weeds down for a while uh, before they die out. 